Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our weekly webinar series that occurs here on our Facebook page every Friday at noon. My name is Brianna. I'm a Sustainable Transportation Vermont intern, and I'm so excited to introduce our speaker for today, who is Rob Williams. And today, Rob will be discussing how, for a century, cars have profoundly shaped U.S. civilization. He's also going to discuss what the 21st century holds for um, U.S. automobility. So I'm going to bring Rob up. Hello, Rob. Brianna, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. I'm good. It's Friday. I know. <laughs> That's good. Um, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Thanks for uh, inviting me. So I, I just gave a, a very brief introduction um, about what you'll be talking about. Um, so if you want to talk a little bit about what you'll be talking about, as well as um, give yourself a little bit of a background for everyone watching. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm a transportation enthusiast, uh, <laughs> like uh, like most humans. Um, I've uh, always been fascinated with how we humans get around. You know how how we how we deploy ourselves across landscapes. If I can channel my inner Jim Kunstler <laughs> for a minute, uh, and for many years, uh, following in my colleague uh, Richard Watts's footsteps, I've taught a course. Uh, at the University of Vermont called Cars, Culture, and Media. Um, but I'm also interested in um, storytelling and digital media, communications, journalism. Uh, I was a yak farmer uh, in Vermont for many years. We, we brought the first herd of yaks to Vermont back in 2008. So I was involved in running a, a, a farm for many years in central Vermont. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. Um, in the Mad River, just kidding, in the, Mad, <laughs> in the Mad River Valley. And uh, so, you know, thinking about transportation broadly and thinking about sustainable transportation broadly, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in human and animal uh, transport as much as I am interested in, uh, you know, more modern mechanized transport, like say, oh, I don't know, cars. <laughs> so, um, and I met a lot of really interesting and, and wise fellow humans along the way uh, and more than my fair share of uh, 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 wise animals uh, as as uh, beasts of burden I guess we'd say and uh, I also really love driving I really love driving as an environmental historian I know I'm not really supposed to say that <laughs> but um, yeah I just uh, fairly recently just drove across North America to deliver my uh, my daughter's car to her uh, out in Washington State. And uh, I was reminded driving across this beautiful continent, uh, what a remarkable, what a remarkable place it is and, and so diverse. And, um, you know, even in the midst of uh, the apocalypse, <laughs> um, it really, uh, really is uh, such a such a luxury and uh, such a privilege to be mobile and uh so maybe we can talk a bit about all of those things uh, in the little bit of time we have today yeah of course um yeah i can just start off asking a first question um you say that you are so passionate about driving and i'm just wondering i think a lot of people feel the same way um and are not ready to give up their car or just the idea of being so independent in their own vehicle. Um, how do you kind of go back and forth with that idea and that passion with um, the given climate crisis? Yeah, you know, that's such a profound question. And I think all of us who are, um, are in, the, in the realm of automobility you know, really struggle with that. Fortunately, there's a brand new book just written that answers that question brilliantly. I'm going to hold it up. I, um, I get no credit for doing this, but um, some of your listeners might be familiar with uh, Matt Crawford, who wrote a, a pretty well-known book called Shop Class as Soulcraft. Um, Shop Class as Soulcraft. He's a, um, he's a uh, car enthusiast. He builds and rebuilds cars and has ever since he was a kid. He's also well-versed in classical philosophy, uh, which he studied um, in university. 
And his brand new book is called Why We Drive Towards a Philosophy of the Open Road. And I read this book actually as I was traveling across North America not too long ago. Um, and it really, um, he really helped me think through why, why, I, why, I, like, why I like driving so much. Um, and it has a lot to do with freedom, of course. And that's the, that's the promise that has been sold to us as drivers for about 100 years. And let me step back for a minute and just say, um, in the cars culture and media class, the course that we teach at UVM, what's, what's one of the many great things about the course is that it's a cross-disciplinary course. So half of the students in there are environmental studies students like yourself. And the other half of the students in the class typically are CDAE uh, communication students who are interested in storytelling and journalism and um, media, digital media, things like that. So what's cool about the course is we get this really neat kind of cross-fertilization of, of disciplines. Um, and I've learned a lot just listening to, um, to my students sort of reflect on what we call the culture of automobility. Uh, all of the kind of behaviors and perceptions and attitudes that surround cars. And, it, and we, we, we do have deeply ambivalent um, feelings about automobility, like we love it and we hate it, right? Yeah. So your question, is like, how do you make sense of the culture of automobility in the climate crisis? And I would say as an environmental historian, the first thing to point out is that automobiles, cars have not always been powered by fossil fuel energy. In fact, the very first successful cars uh, were powered in ways other than gas and oil. And one of the things we look at in the course is that bit of history, which has been mostly forgotten. And we also look at possible futures for the automobile. And I'm sure, you know, many folks who are paying attention are well, well familiar with the promise of the electric car, uh, which Ford and Nissan and probably most famous Elon Musk at Tesla uh, have advanced as a replacement, as an alternative, as a, a kind of futuristic uh, way of uh, driving or not driving cars <laughs> around the landscape. The, the, the promise of the self-driving car, you know, that we're going to, that you're going to be able to walk out of, uh, out of your, your lecture hall, Brianna, at, on campus and get into a car in front of the UVM green next to the food trucks that hopefully will once again be parked there and issue a command. And this car will take you wherever you wish to go while you surf the web or check up on your snaps or read a book, take a nap, God forbid. <laughs> Or visit with friends. So, so this idea of kind of the self-driving car, um, which I have, uh, I'm really conflicted about actually, um, is probably the most seductive um, automobility related promise of, uh, of the coming century millennium, you know? Yeah. Oh, and the other thing I'd say about your question is, um, you know, it's easy to be critical of human in Beauty and brilliance while we enjoy the many benefits of it. Mm -hmm. right? If I had a nickel for every time I heard a person out that the climate is in crisis from their SUV on their mobile phone parked yep. at the fast food restaurant, <laughs> I would be retired and living on my yak farm. <laughs> sort of a, a funny, I guess, lack of appreciation for just how remarkably ingenious an entrepreneur our species has been uh, in inventing uh, novel ways to move us around very efficiently um, and uh, in ways that have led to increased prosperity for our species across the planet. And I've traveled, I've been fortunate to travel a lot in other countries and, and in, in developing countries um, and I don't like that term, but I'll use it because it, people perhaps understand what I mean. But when I'm doing yak research in, let's say, Nepal or Mongolia, um, or I'm in Peru with students traveling in the jungle, or um, uh, even even in, in, in Cuba, you know, which has its own special story, right, in Havana, 
to see other sapiens, other humans around the world develop these kind of deep affectionate bonds with their motorized transport is, is really, really eye opening. Um, in Nepal, for example, all of the cars and trucks in Nepal have images of various uh, Hindu gods or the Buddha kind of woven into the, literally woven into the chassis uh, of their cars and trucks. And so you're driving these crazy Nepalese mountain roads, hoping you're not going to fall off the car, looking over the side, and you're being passed by and getting challenged by coming the other direction, these massive diesel spouting trucks with an image of the Buddha on the grill. <laughs> there's, there's this kind of karmic... Uh, this karmic commitment to uh, automobility in other countries. It's like, you know, we're all kind of dancing and we're in flow state as the Buddhists and the, and the Taoists and the, and the, the Hindus and other religions will, will sort of, will, will teach you. And we're not worried because the karmic gods are in control of our automobility, our flow here. And there's really nothing to worry about. It's really, it's really, yeah. Westerners travel. Have you been over there at all? No, I haven't. You must go. And when you do, um, you have to sort of give yourself over yeah. to a very different transportation sensibility. Yeah. Even mopeds in like Vietnam, like you have to cross 10 lane urban streets in say Ho Chi Minh City. And as a Westerner, it's incredibly terrifying. <laughs> All you have to do is step into traffic and everything else will be taken care of. Mm -hmm. Like you, you just, and, and people, you step into traffic and you kind of make your way across a 10 lane street at rush hour and people on cars and mobiles, they just move around you. It's like, oh yeah, we're not going to hit that guy. We're not going to hit the old woman. We get, we, you know, the cow, the sacred cow on the street of Kathmandu. Nothing to worry about. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very, you know, we, we tend in the West and, and in Vermont, we tend to think in very narrow terms, I think, about, about the culture of automobility and transportation generally. But there's this kind of diverse, this global diversity around it that's really fascinating to me. Yeah, totally. And, and just thinking about the different flows of traffic in different areas of the world and how we're kind of on this new path right now, as you were talking about, with this new flow towards um driveless cars um and stuff do you think that that's the path that we're hitting and we're going on that or do you think we're turning somewhere else yeah i think there's um some incredibly powerful players currently at work on human civilization to push us in the direction of automated everything mm -hmm. you may be familiar with the term the fourth industrial revolution mm -hmm. Uh, if, if folks haven't heard that term, I, I encourage everyone to run to Google. Better yet, run to DuckDuckGo because they won't keep track of your data. <laughs> oh, yeah, because they'll plant a tree when you search, right? Oh, you... yeah, I know that one. Um, but go to a search engine and search and, and really brush up on the fourth industrial revolution because <clears throat> the goal is to really network digitally and automate everything. And a lot of this, of course, is about control. It's about surveillance. It's about 24-7 uh, uh, data flow um, and, and being in control of that information. Um, uh, Klaus Schwab, who runs the World Economic Forum, he's been very outspoken since the COVID began about what these people are calling the Great Reset. The Great Reset, another term we should we should familiarize ourselves with. The goal, they say, is to completely reboot the entire global economy to make it over in the, the image of the digital. And cars and transportation generally are central to that project. Anyone who's ever been in an Uber or a Lyft knows what I mean. There's something really magical, right? Yeah. As Arthur C. Clarke said famously, sufficiently advanced technology when you interact with sufficiently advanced technology it feels like magic have you been in an uber or lyft i'm guessing you have yes 
describe that experience. Like pick pick a moment that you remember because we haven't done this in seven months, right? We've we've yeah. Walked, for, for the moment, it, it'll be back. But what do you what, what's your what, what do you what's your recollection about that experience? Can you describe it? Yeah, I, I think it's worry free and and convenient. The whole experience. I mean, and it's not that big of a financial commitment and usually you're carpooling with other people so it's cheaper um but it's it's just a part of your day and your trip that you don't really have to think about it's put in someone else's hands um yeah, yeah. well said right what the fourth industrial Re revolution promises is everything you just said yeah right? put our destiny as sovereign humans into other people's or other technologies hands and just sit back and enjoy the ride yeah completely this worries me. <laughs> yeah <laughs> as convenient as it is right it mm -hmm. was a couple of friends in burlington who drive or drove for uber and for lyft and they so i would get together with them and they would tell me some incredibly remarkable stories about <laughs> things that happened um, on their drives. But the other thing they said, and, and you probably know this because you're more dialed into the community there at UVM uh, amongst the, the younger crowd than I am at the moment, but how many college students would use yeah. transportation apps to get around, like even to and from campus, mm -hmm. which I yep. really appreciated. Like I got a little bit of that with my students when we would talk, but many of them lived on campus. They would walk, they would bike, thank goodness. Right. Yeah. I'll be doing a lot of that all the time. Um, but I, 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 that's when I began to think several years ago about, all right, so what's coming here? Mm -hmm. uh, coming. Yeah. Tesla, for example, the, the new versions of the Tesla car. And, and we always would have, I, I have a friend, Todd uh, Lockwood in Vermont. Many, many people know him. He's very high profile on social media. He's been very successful as an entrepreneur. And he was one of the first Tesla owners in Vermont. And he's what I call a Tesla evangelist. He comes to our course and he kind of holds forth on the gospel of Tesla, right? And, mm -hmm. and amazing, what amazing cars they are. And he's right, they are. In fact, Musk and company have actually reinvented the car from top to bottom, soup to nuts for the digital age. But a Tesla has 12 different cameras on it that are constantly collecting data as you drive around Burlington or you're out on the interstate and they're feeding all of that 12 cameras worth of data through sensors into a centralized mainframe that's constantly updating uh, g the geography of your drive. And it's patented technology. I think it was designed in Israel, I think is what Todd told me. And imagine every single car on the road equipped with 12 cameras, all 300 plus million of them someday maybe, constantly feeding digital data into a centralized geographically focused database mainframe networked out across the world um, that's kind of keeping an eye on things and moving you from place to place as friction le frictionlessly as possible right and that's kind of the goal of uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon and Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook and Elon Musk at Tesla bringing it back to transportation the folks at the uh, uh, Nissan, who are bringing you the Leaf, the folks at Ford who are bringing us the Volt, you know, these other electric. Mm -hmm. So it really is the, a complete reinvention of transportation for the digital age. And what worries me, and, and Matt Crawford writes quite beautifully about this towards the end of the book, is that we're giving over, we're giving over our freedom and autonomy uh, as drivers in the culture of automobility. We're giving over all of that and our privacy too, let's not forget. Um, our privacy too, to uh, kind of the lords of the transportation cloud, if you would. Mm -hmm. um, one of the great things I like about driving, back to that, is um, I can turn off my phone and, and, and stash it in the trunk, um, and then I'm alone with yep. my own thoughts. Like driving 3,000 miles um, by myself, um, again, was hard. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> I had us off to long haul truckers, but it was so, um, it was so refreshing. It was almost like being in a monastery, like a rolling monastery, um, just to be alone in the privacy of my own thoughts for several days. And I could, I could get up and go to bed and, and when I wanted, I could stop and go when I wanted. Right. And yeah. I, 
I traveled 3,000 miles on $300. Wow, that's that's very interesting. I call my own food and water. It's just the price of gas. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. No, yeah, I, I think about that. I, I drove, I, um, I was in a car that drove to Colorado this summer from Vermont, and I was thinking about the price and just compared to a plane ticket there, you know? Um, we didn't, we, we brought like snacks, but we definitely bought our meals and stuff. <laughs> but uh, it was definitely, even so, still cheaper than a plane ticket for one of us. Yeah, I mean, and again, we take that kind of freedom based on human ingenuity and our, our, our grasp of complex technology, we take that for granted, I think. Mm -hmm. you know, Kind of the tribalized political culture we live in, and the COVID, and the fires in California out west, and the and the you know the the institutionalized racism, and the you know there's so much going on right now that we forget just how far we have come as a species. And I think automobility represents kind of in some ways the pinnacle of that. Um, and again, as an environmentalist, I worry. As an environmental historian, I appreciate. Right, looking back at our even recent past, how liberatory in some ways automobility has been. But there is, of course, some significant prices to pay in terms of fossil fuel energy, in terms of car accidents, in terms of the expense of owning a car. All of this we talk about in our, in our course. In terms of maintaining the infrastructure, um, right, the interstate highway system is the most massive um, uh, uh, national uh, transportation project ever attempted. Only, it's about to be surpassed by what the Chinese are doing with the new Silk Roads in China. Uh, have you been following this? Have you been no. Do you mind talking about it a little bit just for everyone? I, I was in Beijing in 20, I think it was 2013 when the new president Xi Jinping was um, elected and everyone, my, my Chinese friends were saying, watch this guy because he's going to be as powerful as Mao was when Mao founded the People's Republic of China in in uh, 1949, right? And so um, what Xi Jinping has set out to do is nothing short of an end run around United States and allied or Western kind of dominance of Eurasia by building a massive interstate highway system from Western China all the way to Istanbul. And the goal in Turkey, and the goal is to pull all of Europe and Asia into the Chinese orbit on land while the U.S. Navy continues to patrol the eastern shores of China by sea. And we actually took some students out to western China four or five years ago. Wow. Yeah, it was cool. We yeah. drove the first hundred miles of the newly constructed uh, New Silk Road project. Um, they also call it the Belt and Road, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, the belt refers to ocean ports um, that will accompany the, the thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so, um, yeah, so there's huge, there's a huge price to pay, um, from individual car ownership all the way to maintaining this massive infrastructure. And we're all familiar with it in Vermont because like in a lot of places around the United States, our infrastructure is not in good shape. Um, and there doesn't seem to be, there's a whole lot of, um, there's a whole lot of interest, shall we say, from either one of the two major political parties in doing much about that. Um, my hat is off to all of the Vermont road crews who, you know, every summer, right, there's the joke in Vermont is like there's seven seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall, stick, mud, and road construction. <laughs> and they're out there every road construction season getting it done. It's hard work. It's laborious. Um, we just finally, after seven years, after Irene blew through central Vermont, we finally had a two lane stone bridge now being replaced. Um, and, you know, they had to put up a stoplight for seven years to keep traffic to one way across this bridge. And, and that to me was kind of like a metaphor for, you know, the costs of, of, of automobility, of, of this kind of transportation. We're getting some great questions, by the way. Yeah, um, I can read some of them to you if you'd like. They just started flooding in. Um, so our first one is from Dave Cohen, and Dave says, great talk. Our car culture really cooperations have taught us that we are individuals driving cars and pursuing our individual dream of nearly unlimited mobility. Isn't that a delusion? Maybe we are truly 
maybe we truly, we are not individuals just driving cars, but herd of, hold on. Herds of metallic bodies. Yes. Um, on the landscape in a sort of tyranny of motorized majority over the world. Isn't this a tragedy of the commons of our biosphere soundscapes, the more than human world and over anyone who wants to use their bodies and uncared, uncarred, not in a car, um, on the landscape and so much more. Yeah. I mean, there's, there, there, thanks Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We could do another hour. Um, on those, but, but, but to be, to be brief and he's absolutely right. I mean, the, the first thing, the first concept that we sort of get at in the, in the cars culture media course is this economic notion of trade-offs. Like what do we give and what do we, what, what, what do we have to give up and what do we get um, in the culture of automobility? And I think it's a bit simplistic to suggest that when we're in our cars, we are alone. Although anyone who's ever driven solo, right, knows how easy it is to slip into that trance, right? Cars are yeah. built it's in a trance in a way. It's very, there's a whole kind of, you know, engineering and uh, design element that we talk about in, in the course. Carjacked is a wonderful book, by the way, one of the books we teach. Um, and yes, there's a massive price to pay in terms of regimenting this, uh, how we move through the landscape at the expense of other ways of transportation, whether it's yaks or bicyclists or people on foot or wild creatures who run across our path and, and get destroyed uh, under the tires, right? We've maybe have all had that experience. Um, so, so understanding the trade-offs of uh, the culture of automobility is, is really central to that. I would also say though, and maybe let me ask you this, Brianna. You just drove to Colorado with friends. Mm -hmm. You alone on that trip? Or were you in the company of your friends? Was it a more social and convivial experience? Social, definitely. So, so can you talk a little bit about like what that was like? How many days were we on the road? Other than snacks, like what'd you do? Uh, it was two 15 hour days and we- Well, we lost you. I lost you. Oh, can you hear me now? Sound. Can you hear me now? Can you Sorry. hear me now? Hold on. How about now? <laughs> Maybe I'll reboot. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I can't hear you. Okay. Um, I could try refreshing the page. Should I do that? Okay. Try that. Okay. Well, um, Rob is rebooting his um, page. Um, for anyone that has questions for Rob, please put them in the comment section and we will get to them. Can you hear me now? Let me try. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, I can't hear you. That's weird. I unplugged my headphones. It's not that. Hmm. Still hear me okay? That's weird. Yeah. Um, do you know how to sign? <laughs> <laughs> um. All right, well, I'm pretty good at actually reading lips, so let's maybe the it'll come back. But um, so can you talk a bit about like the social element of your trip? Yeah. Um, we, we really listen to a lot of podcasts, um, listen to music, chatted, but it was a bonding experience that I've never had before. It was just different. Um, I, can you hear me? So I think I hear you saying that it was fun. There was a lot of conversation. Um, and you got to sort of uh, experience the landscape. Yeah, yeah, those are all true. Good. Yeah, and sorry, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, like I said, I can sort of see what you're saying, but so, but back to this idea of trade-offs, and I'm seeing, you know, a few questions about this. I, it, it's absolutely central um, to acknowledge, and, and um, I love uh, Jacob's question here. How do we overcome the grief 
of all the pollution that comes from individual driving trips. Um, should we should we praise that mindset instead of investing in alternative transportation? Um, these are all really good questions, and I, I think we we have a tendency to sort of think in binary kind of either or terms about you know, really most any topic, but certainly this is true of transportation as well. Um, so as we kind of, and, and maybe we should focus, Brianna, on like where we're going with transportation in Vermont. I, I was struck by um, James Howard Kunstler's kind of thinking about the future of, um, of transportation, particularly in Vermont. Um, are you familiar with the idea of exurbia? We have suburbia. Do you know exurbia? So exurbia refers to communities that lie outside of suburbia. And Vermont is like a giant exurban or exurban landscape, other than like Burlington and Rutland and Brattleboro and Montpelier to some extent. We're essentially a state that is exurban, right? We are rural communities, 251 plus towns, all connected together by a series of roads and um, the interstate. And of course, let's not forget trails like the Long Trail and the Adirondack um, VAT um, and, you know, uh, skiing and riding and, and, and snow machining and hiking and hunting. And so, so like any other place, Vermont has a really fantastic sort of uh, networked transportation grid um, and we can move through Vermont any one of a dozen plus ways, right? On foot, uh, yak back, bicycle, uh, snow machine, automobile. So, you, you know, in looking at some of these questions, um, I think if we can figure out how to reinvent Vermont's transportation system to take full advantage of our exurban um, culture, um, that would be to our benefit. I know, for example, James Kunstler is fond of the train. Uh, and I love, I, I also am a big fan of, of trains. You know, the reality is, um, and Amtrak and, and Vermont train workers will be the first to tell you, um, you know, the Vermont train transportation system is pretty substandard right now. Trains show cold slow down speed because our tracks are so sort of marginal. Um, so we have some hard decisions to make about where and how we invest in, you know, transportation infrastructure moving forward. Um, and these are not easy questions to answer, uh, particularly now, of course, in the time of COVID where we've just seen kind of all of our revenue generation for tax collection, what have you, just collapse, you know, over the past six or seven months. So I've been an advocate for many years of public banking. I've been an advocate of investing in infrastructure. Um, I have friends in the permaculture business in Vermont who have suggested, and I love this idea, you know the interstate, I'm sure you've been on it, I-89. And in between the north and south lanes of Interstate 89, there are miles of grassy median strip right? That area in between North and South. And right now, all we're doing with that is mowing it. So we're thinking about that. We're wasting prodigious amounts of fossil fuel energy to mow the grassy median every summer from May to October. What if we were, turn, we were to turn the grassy median into cultivable land, right? What if we were to plant, as my permaculture friends, I'm channeling them, I can't take credit for this idea. Um, what if we were to plant, uh, plant pecan trees, right? along the interstate and then we would harvest the pecans and you know, help feed ourselves every winter. And I realize that's a simplistic kind of uh, uh, idea that would require some you know, real strategic thinking. But how do we take our existing transportation infrastructure and retool them in a more strategic and thoughtful way for um, a more decentralist kind of 21st century vision? Um, so that's um, that's a, a lot of what I'm thinking about. And I'm seeing Jack's question here about psychology. Um, and I would say, Jack, um, I actually, as a songwriter myself, I get I do some of my best writing while driving. But I also um, love your point about uh, slowing down, um, walking, uh, biking, 
far better psychologically in terms of a solo activity. I would say it's parallel comparable, um, but uh, I don't know if I would put a value judgment on it like better or not. I guess everyone is different. Um, Riley asks, I'm just going to read the questions, Brianna. Is that okay? So Riley, hi, Riley. Um, I hope you're here. I hope you're in Vermont. Um, trains, planes, boats, or railroad for moving goods from A to B. I would say it's really a combination um, of all of those, given what we know about fossil fuel energy, given what we know about alternatives um, moving forward, given our current COVID moment, given the pressures of the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution, I want to keep everything as human scale as possible. And that might sound like a contradiction in terms since I am a car enthusiast. But um, as I said earlier, um, cars do not have to be powered by fossil fuel energy. There are other ways to think about cars and automobility. And secondly, what about buses? What about carpooling? What about um, small decentralized ways to move people around landscapes in ways that make sense? Um, or trucks, not trains twice, <laughs> exactly. Um, I want to make sure I saw another question come in. Oh, it was Dave. Um, yeah, how do we account for um, the unmotorized? And I know that's a big that's a big discussion in Burlington uh, with bike paths and 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 public uh, transportation and and walkability. Um, I think we've done a reasonably good job in Burlington. There's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, tip of the hat to Luis Vivanco at UVM, who uh, has done a lot of thinking about this. Richard Watts, too. Um, we're rebuilding the bike path right now down uh, in front of the Echo. That's kind of a big, big project. May it continue. Um, so thinking about the future, assuming, as James Kunstler said last week on this program, assuming we can figure out how to pay for it, how we can attract investment capital to build um, or repurpose existing transportation networks. This seems like really critical in the 21st century. And back to the exurbia thing. I think Vermont is going to be increasingly popular as a place to come not only visit, but a place to live um, as the 21st century unfolds. Um, and not just because of the COVID. Um, Richard Watts and I have talked a little bit about this. Um, so again, how do we retool Vermont as an exurban uh, transportation network to fully take advantage of um, bringing entrepreneurial people to the state in numbers sufficient enough to support human and other creatures existence here collectively, but not turn Vermont into dare I say Massachusetts, I'll say California. Um, I don't want to offend anybody from Massachusetts, but hope, hopefully the point's taken. Um, Jack, do you think it would be better to enhance the logistics of the bus routes and make them more accessible and frequent? Um, great question. Having, rid the pub, having ridden the public bus from Montpelier, Waterbury, up to Burlington on many occasions, I think it's fantastic. Um, and I actually... <laughs> It, it, I actually do a lot of visiting um, on the bus because I always run into people I know, as many Vermonters do in, in public transport. And, and Jack, I would push it a little bit further and say, can we do the same thing for out-of-state tourists who are visiting Vermont? You know, we were smart enough in the 1960s to ban billboards and create kind of a, a, a multi-sensory world apart experience for visitors to to Vermont, could we could we somehow up up the ante there? Um, and th there are other parts of the world that do this quite well. You know, it could be public buses that meet people at the border and make it easy for them to get to, say, ski mountains or what have you. Maybe we could up our game with the trains. Um, so I love your question; it's great, Dave. Any thoughts about the sensory deficits that occur within the automotive experience and how that shapes our minds, perceptions, and worldview? quoting the oh-so-great uh, Marshall McLuhan. Um, there are trade-offs, again, in the culture of automobility and driving. Um, and I sometimes really appreciate 
the the flow state that comes with driving. I mentioned that before. Even a short commute in a fuel efficient vehicle from Burlington home a few days or nights a week um, allows me to do some thinking to sort of process the day to appreciate the beauty of our space um, in Vermont to see camel's hump by sunset because I wasn't able to hike up at that day. Um, and I realize, you know, there, there are trade-offs there. So um, we're going to wrap things up. I got you, Brianna. I'm so sorry we lost you um, on the, uh, oh, there you are. Great. Can you hear me now? Um, thanks for having me. Um, one last thing. Um, you know, James Kunstler didn't do a very good job of pr plugging his, um, his uh, excuse my French, uh, clusterfucknation.com website where he does some great writing and he has a new book called Living in the Long Emergency. And I just wanted to mention also vermontindependent.net is where we do a lot of our thinking around transportation and resilience in Vermont, vermontindependent.net. So I hope folks will check that out. And one last time, love this book. Um, thank you for having me, Brianna. Thank you so much for being here. Um, for everyone who uh, made comments, thank you so much for commenting. And we hope to see you next Friday at noon. Stay tuned to our Facebook page as well as our Instagram. And we'll see you next Friday.